Willkommen zurück, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Teilnehmende zum University Future Festival. Heute haben wir den Conference Day, das heißt, wir haben von frühmorgens bis spätabends renommierte Speakerinnen und Speaker, die ihre Perspektive auf das Thema digitale Hochschulbildung werfen und mit uns im Q&A gemeinsam diskutieren. Es geht nun weiter mit der siebten Keynote des Tages. Sie wird gehalten von Irlands erstem Professor für digitales Lernen und Direktor des National Institutes for Digital Learning an der Dublin City University. Er ist sowohl Fellow als auch Mitglied des Exekutivausschusses des European Distance and E-Learning Networks und gehört dem Aufsichtsrat der European Association of Distance Teaching Universities an. Im Jahr 2017 erkannte der Commonwealth of Learning ihn als einen der weltweit führenden Anbieter von offenem Unterricht und Fernlehre an. Und im Jahr 2019 war er Vorsitzender der ICDI-Weltkonferenz über Online-Lernen. Wir fliegen mit ihm direkt in die Zukunft. Back again to the future. Unboxing Digital Education 4.0. A warm welcome to Professor Mark Brown. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and hello, everyone, um, wherever you may be located in these uh, very challenging and interesting times. Um, I hope I can put together a, an interesting and thought-provoking talk um, for this afternoon's program. And um, I probably don't need to say too much more about my background. That was very comprehensive, thank you, and a little embarrassing at the outset. Um, but uh, just for the record, I'm the director of the National Institute for Digital Learning, but based in one university in Dublin and originally from New Zealand. Um, it's a little egotistical to show this photo, but it's quite symbolic because I'm actually wearing an Irish uh, jersey here, a sports jersey, a rugby team. But this was from November last year when we hosted the World Conference on Online Learning. And who in November could have predicted what the world would be looking like now, particularly in terms of higher education and the pivot to online delivery in all sorts of forms. Um, let's wait for my slides to load. I'm just a little slow here by the look of it, folks. We'll see if it's going to move forward. I wonder um, how many of you have actually heard of, um, on, of unboxing, which is the metaphor that I've anchored this talk in. And I did have a poll planned at this stage, but I had an earlier session this morning. And, and in light of the time constraints, I'll just leave you to either respond in the chat box, because I do have that open and will try to multitask um, as I'm talking. Um, if you have young children, you may have heard of unboxing. Um, Unboxing is a phenomenon on uh, YouTube. And in fact, some people make quite a lot of money out of unboxing if not if you have not come across this term previously. Um, and uh, it's quite an interesting metaphor because YouTube has had to change its terms of conditions because very young children were engaged in unboxing, which is effectively videoing themselves as they unbox a surprise present of some kind. Um, it's an interesting metaphor because actually there's a political economy to unboxing because even young children were being paid by the um, commercial uh, companies producing the goods that they were unboxing. Um, so they were receiving uh, payments so they could profile their products. And it's a metaphor, if you like, for the commercialization of education. Um, a metaphor for the way education is becoming more of a commodity, a personal commodity, something that you can box and present and own. Um, and it's a metaphor also for that sense of thrill and excitement you get as you're unboxing something new. But you know what? Many occasions, as you get a little older like me, that excitement and thrill wears off quite quickly. And whatever you've got in the box gets discarded or put away somewhere. So that's the metaphor that I've tried to um, build into this um, talk. 
and hopefully my slides are going to be uh, advancing a little quicker than we've got currently. Otherwise, I, I may even go back to sharing the screen. I don't know, um, that may be a better option here. They're very uh, graphically hungry, as you can see. I can remember what was next. I would keep talking here, but I need a little cue. Um, and that's gone backwards. Okay, so um, we will just keep going, I think. Seem to be, that's much faster now. Um, okay, uh, so using this metaphor of unboxing, I want to also come with a very critical lens. And I live my academic career very much by the saying that the light comes through the gaps or the light comes through the cracks. And when we're thinking about the future, we even have to problematize, why are we thinking about the future? There have been other occasions in the past where the future has become very popular, um, particularly during the, Sp the Sputnik period, um, when all of a sudden there was a concern about the need for new engineers and what we would call STEM education now. So the future itself and our interest in the future is not a neutral activity. And there are many powerful change forces at work here, some of which I've um, identified on the box. Um, but there's also a lot of myth and misinformation that comes with some of these um, change forces as well. Ultimately, um, one of the gaps that we have to address is this gap between the near and the far. And I'm borrowing from Hank Becker's work to talk about how working in new education with new digital technologies is a little bit like um, running to catch a moving train, a fast moving train. What we talk about today is almost out of date by the time we finish. Um, and one of the challenges this is that we are too easily led by the technology itself, even though we try to think that um, we have a strong pedagogical teaching and learning focus. The truth is, of course, the two go hand in hand and are much more entangled, which I will share with you shortly. So for the time I have left, I want to cover three things. Um, I may even only get time to cover two, but my slides are going to be available for you to look at. And if I don't get a chance to talk about breaking out of the box, that's OK, because you can look for yourself and I'll post some links. But we'll see how we get on. Um, perhaps, though, in case I do run a little short on time, I want to leave you with my key message right at the start. And I'm going to borrow from the words of um, Toffler, Elvin Toffler, when we think about the future. All education springs from um, the images of the future, and all education creates images of the future. Um, now, I do need my uh, sl next slide to really help me finish off the quote. See how we get on here. We were doing well there for a minute. Um, effectively, um, the quote will come up in a minute, but what it says is that if we don't think about the future that we want to create, not the future that's being created for us, then we may actually do very serious harm to those who we have some responsibility for in terms of teaching and learning. I'm not sure whether we're going to be successful here. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, oh, there we go. It looks like it's easier if I advance a bit quicker. So if you're looking for that quote, we can do tragic damage to those we teach. if We don't actually talk more about the future we want, not the future that's being created for us. Okay, past lessons. I'm going to do this very quickly with an eye on the time because some of you, I'm sure, have seen what I'm going to talk about previously. It often gets shared by keynote speakers. Um, and hopefully I'm not offending anyone here using a, a Churchill quote in Ireland. I would not use a Churchill quote because obviously Ireland is not part of the United Kingdom. But Churchill did once say that the, farther ba the further backward you look, the farther forward you see um, into the future. And so I want to do a little bit of a backward look in order to understand where we might be going. Here's a quote from 1994 about um, what 
appears to be the first really introduction of the world wide web. Remember, most, most of us um, lived a life before then. There are others, of course, in today's generation who do not know anything before the world wide web. Actually, you know, this quote about the automatic library of the future doesn't come from 1994, it comes from 1894. And it refers to the invention of the wax phonograph cylinder. So you see these kind of bold claims about what technology will do in the future. And there's a long legacy of these or a long history. Um, and hopefully we were going well again there for a minute. Too much load on the system or my bandwidth here in Ireland isn't good enough. Here's one that's um, very frequently cited from Thomas Edison, and I won't spend time going over it other than to say about how the motion picture was going to revolutionize the education system. And then we have one uh, moving on a little bit um, to 1935 about how television, and of course, television was invented much earlier than most people appreciate, and television would be the future for the delivery of lectures online. Well, you know, history has a habit of repeating itself um, and things are still not that far different from what was being predicted here. You may not be able to see the screen very well, but actually Blackboard was still being referred to as a metaphor for the delivery. And of course, Blackboard is one of the world's most dominant learning management systems. One of the most famous um, projects known as Project Plato um, made ex very, very interesting claims about what would happen in the future. And I'm not going to show you the video clip here. I've just posted a link to that in the um, chat box that I invite you to have a look at. It's only a minute's video from the 1960s, but basically arguing that as you see the visual here, this learning in a cubicle from a machine was going to be the future of world education. How wrong they got it. But actually the underlying metaphor of what I'll describe here as the old pump, pump, dump model of pedagogy has not gone away. And sadly, um, unfortunately, perhaps we had no choice in many cases in the COVID crisis, a lot of what we were doing was education down a pipe, delivering it to learners. A little bit like I'm doing now if I'm self-critical. So um, I'm going to give you one more, more recent quote on the next slide, which um, refers to really the advent of the MOOC. And again, these are quite commonly known quotes here, um, talking about that in the future, the very future of the university, may we at risk um, as a consequence of the development of MOOCs. Only so much I can do to, to fill in the gaps here. Hopefully it's coming. There we go. There's the quote I was referring to, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then um, I guess the lesson I'm trying to paint here is that there's a long history of hype, hope and disappointment when it comes to claims around the future impact of new technologies. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Gartner hype cycle. It's something that I dislike with a passion. Um, this claims to be able to show the trajectory of any new technology, both into education and society more generally. If you um, do uh, use this cycle, what I would alert you to the fact is it's inherently technocentric. It focuses on the technology, not the context in which it's used. And the context is critical here. Um, it's also, um, really very much uh, focused on the technology itself as distinct from the pedagogy. Um, and there are other aspects to it in terms of uh, its underlying assumptions about change. So I much prefer to think of change in an ecological sense, like an ecology, and that universities um, and institutions of learning are part of that ecology. They're in themselves a, a, an ecosystem. And what's important here, the Gartner hype cycle places the emphasis on resistance to change. And that's seen as what the focus should be on. Whereas an ecological metaphor places the emphasis on resilience and adaptation. 
And both of those are traits that we've learned a lot about in the COVID-19 experience, resilience in particular. I mean, if you extend this metaphor um, into these four quadrants I'm going to show you, in the past, you could say um, very much our focus in higher education was on on campus, in class, or for schooling education, in school, in class. And if there's one thing that the um, digital uh, transformation or the digital disruption that we've experienced over the past six months, but it was well before then as well, is we've unboxed these four other quadrants. That learning now is inherently also something that takes place on campus, out of class, when you can go on campus, but just as important off campus in class and off campus out of class. And in the future, when we're thinking about learning, we have to think of all four of those quadrants in both formal learning and informal learning, physical learning and virtual forms of learning. And we seem to have just gone backwards there. Um, concluding this first section, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is in the unboxing in that metaphor I've shared with you or the diagram there is face-to-face -face teaching. And this is an example from Trinity College in Dublin, a 500 plus year old university. Face-to-face -face teaching can no longer be seen as the gold standard of education. Actually, sitting in the back of a lecture theatre, um, falling asleep was never the gold standard of education. But there are still many people who see that as the measure that we should require online education to come up against. So a lesson, um, I'll finish this section with a lesson, which is, I think when we're thinking about the impact of new technology, even though the technology can um, drive our thinking more than it should, we should not underestimate the long-term impact. Uh, we tend to overestimate the short-term impact, but actually underestimate the long-term impact. And I'm sure there are going to be a tremendous legacy um, and a positive sense, as well as challenges as a consequence of COVID-19. Okay, competing futures. And I'll, I'll need to be quick on this, um, just slowed down slightly, I think, with the uh, delay with the slides. There are lots of people that have talked about the future of universities. And as I seen, said previously, this is not a new subject of discussion. I've just put a link to the report in the chat box. Um, other work, um, this work comes from EY. Um, this is uh, uh, Ernest Young, what was once Ernest Young, and they produced this report a couple of years ago, again, giving the future of universities and a number of scenarios. I hope just put those scenarios in the chat box or at least a, a link to those. Um, lots and lots of authors talk about um, college disrupted, the future of universities, uh, and there's just a mass of these books. The takeaway point for me from a critical perspective is that different interest groups and stakeholders, different authors, different perspectives often use the same language of digital transformation, digital disruption, but to legitimize very different agenda. They don't have the end goal in mind. And I want to illustrate that um, with a somewhat simplistic example, but hopefully uh, it resonates with you. Um, the point I will make is that uh, there are complex theories that you could use to understand the various change forces at work when we are talking about the future of higher education. But Einstein once said that if you can't say it simply enough, you don't understand it well enough. So I'm just going to give you two contrasting perspectives if I can get the, the next slide to come through. So the first perspective I want to share with you, um, and please remember, I'm, uh, this is a very simplistic um, analysis just to illustrate a point. I'll call this the knowledge economy perspective, where education is very much being seen as this commodity for um, acquisition, uh, where individuals are being encouraged to pursue their education for personal gain, uh, economic benefits, rather than for public and collective benefits. So the same language of reimagination, even democratization is being used to reflect this knowledge economy perspective. 
And I'm going to draw on a, a quote from someone who's very much in the media right now. And again, I'm just a little hamstrung. Um, I do need the next slide to come if we can get that. I've jumped ahead a couple, so we may jump a couple of slides as we're waiting. And I'll go back if necessary. So I said someone very much uh, in the media at the moment. Um, I won't read the full quote, but this knowledge economy perspective of the future of higher education is also kind of um, straddles the Atlantic from a North American view versus a European view, where education is very much about competition, preparing people in this sense for the American way. Contrasting that with what I'll call the knowledge society or the learning society perspective, which is a long and noble tradition coming from Europe in particular and Germany, uh, very much leading in this space. I will read a bit of this quote because I've deliberately contrasted President Trump with our own President Higgins in Ireland. In uh, a keynote that he gave on the future of universities, he talked about education has a crucial role to play in laying the foundations for a society that is more inclusive, participatory and equal. Goes on to say that universities' roles to address the grand challenges of poverty, climate change and sustainability. So you really couldn't get two more contrasting perspectives. Having said that, this slide illustrates that when you unbox these, it's actually a lot messier than I've presented and far more entangled because the reality is, is to pay for the knowledge um, society, the learning society, you do need a knowledge economy. So we should not treat these as binaries. They're entangled and complex. But they do help us understand a little bit more about the future we might want. And I'm coming to the end of this section in that I like to keep things as simple as possible, but emphasize they are not binaries. At the moment, when we're talking about the future, we hear a lot about education and change and how we have to respond to change. Actually, there are a lot of future um, fakers and future takers. What I'm arguing is that we need to move our language more to being future makers and in particular, start talking about education for change. What is the change that we want to see in the future? And so lesson two here is that when we're talking about the future, our ideas about the role of technology in education are shaped and reshaped by our ideas about what constitutes the good society. And I think I, I, I like uh, when I am able to travel to Germany because this sort of thinking resonates very much with my German colleagues. It doesn't necessarily in other parts of the world where education, as I say, has become more commercialized. Um, and so uh, I'm just going to touch very briefly. So I do leave a bit of time for questions. Um, I think I would have been all right if I hadn't had the slight holdups. In this last section, I don't have any simple answers about breaking out of the box. But um, the first part, I would say, in terms of how you break out of the box, you have to do that at a personal level. You have to be able to um, get yourself out of your current thinking. And I'm sharing this journal article with you, and I've posted the link, I think, in the chat box, something we published earlier in the year. And we used a methodology called speculative fiction. So we weren't shackled by today's thinking. Um, a much more creative way of thinking. Um, scenario planning is another way of thinking out of your out of the box, if you like. The point here is that transformative mindsets, which is what you really need, are far more important than any focus on technical skill sets if you really want to unbox the future for all. Um, so from that kind of personal perspective, then um, I'm sure many of you have come across this model. It's um, sometimes open to a lot of critique. But when you're talking about the role of new technologies, are you wanting to bolt them onto the existing system or truly unbox for transformation and redefinition? And the cold, hard, uncomfortable truth is that most institutions are very much at the other end of the, this continuum where they're merely just looking at enhancement and substitution. That might be OK, depending upon your context. Um, at Dublin City University, we've made a lot of effort in using MOOCs to 
help us unbox the teaching and learning experience because we can do use those as almost a play place, a play space to do things differently. MOOCs were never about um, trying to develop our profile and promote our courses to an international market. They were a place for innovation, to do things differently. And then um, I was going well there for a second with the slides. I'm almost done and I'm keeping an eye on that time, folks. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to leave much time for interactivity here. See if we can get to the next one. Um, uh, another element to what we've been doing very much, and this is um, particularly topical, I know it is in Germany, but right across Europe at the moment, is micro-credentials. Um, and so for me, micro-credentials are a very important and interesting area of work. Uh, I've been serving on the European Commission's expert group in this area. I've just posted a link to what is on the next slide if I get to it. Um, so we see micro-credentials as a form of unboxing, of unbundling and trying to think differently about the future. Um, and then I have a slide that will come after that, I think, eventually, which is through the University Alliance funding that the European Commission um, has made available. My own university, and I'm heavily involved in what's called the ECIU University, and this is 12 universities collaborating to share their courses uh, an online dimension, micro-credentialing as well, part of the um, initiative. I don't think I probably need to go back. There's the, the missing slides, um, and I'll post a link to the ECIU in a second uh, as well. So the final lesson here is, and apologies, that last little bit was a little quick. Um, if you're talking about transformation, you just can't unbox something and expect the shiny new thing that you unbox is going to suddenly transform pedagogy because it looks good. Um, and that's true for an institutional strategy. It's true for a new technology um, and so forth. So final thoughts, uh, and then I'll take a quick cast of eye at the conversations that have gone um, is that you could say a conclusion is a place where you got tired of thinking it's probably in this case more where you ran out of time so i'm just going to leave one final slide which in a more optimistic way says that as much as anything as i in indicated about the importance of mindsets there's a great irish quote that if you um uh, you have to try again or you have to fail fail again fail even better and then fail again. Um, and so we must not give up at an individual level and an institutional level to keep trying to unbox, keep trying to do things differently um, and be future makers, not future takers. So I'm gonna stop on that note. Um, someone's telling me they're not seeing the, the posts that I'm linking so to, so hopefully we can solve that if they're not coming through for everyone. I'm just scanning to see if there are any questions or if there's a moderator that wants to come in with any questions as well. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Brown, for your inspirational uh, keynote talk. I either can't detect any questions up to this point that leads me to saying that I can very much relate uh, with your dislike, with your passionate dislike of the Gartner hype cycle, um, because I'm a, a moderator often also for events in digital economy. And this is like a, a must on the slides on every single uh, presentation um, without really this kind of ecological view that you highlighted. There clearly is something important missing uh, with just a, a focus on the mere technology. So thanks again for readjusting this focus to an ecological perspective. And thank you very much for sketching that out. Um, and I still see there are no questions. So uh, we will end this right here. I wish you all the best. It was a pleasure having you, Professor Brown. Well, thank you very much. And apologies, I was just a little slow with those slides and I would have probably had a bit more time to take some Q&A. Slides are going to be available for you and I always welcome follow-up emails or tweets or whatever if anyone wants to learn more. So thanks for the invitation. Have a good day.